Hi, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Richard Buangan, Acting Assistant Secretary of State for Global Public Affairs. It's my honor to moderate this important and timely event today to celebrate the contributions of Americans of Southeast Asian heritage to the United States, organized by the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and the Department of State. May is Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month in the United States. This month, we celebrate our community's uh, journey of resilience and pay tribute to generations of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders who have paved the way for greater opportunity. We also recommit ourselves to confronting discrimination and hate in all their forms so that together we can create an America that is truly equitable and inclusive. While we celebrate the legacy of all Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, today's event has a particular focus. With President Biden's special summit with the leaders of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, coming up this week, we have arranged this event specifically to highlight the impressive role Americans with ties to Southeast Asia and the ASEAN member states have played in US history and our modern society. I'm doubly pleased to be here because I am a fellow member of the Southeast Asian diaspora. I'm a proud member of the Filipino American community, having grown up in two of some of the largest Philam communities in California and Hawaii. So shout out to all my Pinoy brothers and sisters joining us today. Today we will introduce and hear from a distinguished group of Americans, all of whom have familial ties to the nations of ASEAN. In particular, I would like to acknowledge and thank the esteemed Senator from the great state of Illinois, Tammy Duckworth, for joining us today. We will be hearing from the Senator shortly. We will spotlight the extraordinary accomplishments of today's speakers and all Americans whose heritage links them to Southeast Asia and how their contributions also make our nation stronger, more inclusive, and more successful. And we want to hear from you as well. If you have a question or a comment, please share them in the chat box. And we, we have a team going through them throughout the program. So when we get to the Q&A portion a little bit later, they'll be ready for me to ask our guests. Our first distinguished guest is Senator Tammany Duckworth. Senator Duckworth is the first American of Thai heritage to ever serve in Congress. She's also a veteran of the Iraq War, Purple Heart recipient, former Assistant Secretary of the US Department of Veterans Affairs, and the first woman to have a baby while holding office in the US Senate. Senator, it is truly a privilege to have you joining us today. I'd like you to ask you to now share a few words about the contributions of Southeast Asian Americans to the United States, and perhaps share a little of your own story that has brought you to serve the American people in the military, in the executive branch, and now in the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everybody, for being on today. Hello, everyone. Um, well, thank you for that very kind introduction, um, celebrating our community and all that it's accomplished, no matter what the odds have been, is uh, a great joy today. It's a real honor to be here. ASEAN does some incredible work, and I'm looking forward to hearing what new ideas will come out of this week's ASEAN Summit. As I really said, I'm an American, but my Thai heritage, and in fact, I didn't speak English until I was eight years old, I spoke Thai. But my Thai heritage makes me not only a living example of the friendship between America and Thailand, but also of the unshakable bond between the United States and Southeast Asia as a whole. So I know firsthand that the st American story as we know it would not exist if it weren't for that strength and for the sweat of the AANHPI community. In a very literal sense, Asian Americans help unite this country, helping build the railroad that stretched from sea to shining sea. Um, in celebrating Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, we are reminded of all those contributions of Asian immigrants who've come to our shores and from faraway nations and of the continued contributions of their children and their children's children. But tragically, we are also reminded of the events of the past few years where members of our communities were pushed down and kicked shoved and spit on simply because of the color of their skin and the lilt of their accent. Last year, my own 80 year old mother came home from the grocery store visibly upset because she'd been harassed by a grocery store clerk who kept pushing her away. Um, and all she was trying to do was buy some grapes <laughs> in the produce aisle for my, for my daughter, for her granddaughter. Yet the clerk kept on harassing her, kept on hassling her. And finally this clerk uh, said, you know, it's because of you that I have to wear this mask. 
Um, and she finally confronted him and, and, and just responded to me saying, listen, I'm here to buy grapes for my granddaughter's lunch. I'm not here to fight you. Just get out of my way. I'm not responsible for the virus and you should wear your mask. Um, you know, too many other Asian Americans have experienced similar indecencies and much, much worse over the course of the pandemic that we're still working our way through because hate is relentless. It doesn't stop and it has no rhyme, no reason. So what we must do in response is say clearly that standing up for what is right, that speaking out against prejudice on behalf of justice is an American obligation. So that's one reason I was so proud that President Biden signed my COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act into law, a bill I wrote to help strengthen our enforcement of existing hate crime legislations, not just for hate crimes against Asians, but hate crimes against anybody. After all, the United States government must be resolute in demonstrating that there will be zero tolerance for hate. Because I, if I believe one thing, it's that today's status quo does not need to be tomorrow's reality. And in fact, the diversity in this country, the fact that we have so many uh, Southeast Asian, uh, uh, you know, people of Southeast Asian descent in the United States makes us stronger for the future. It means that we are better able to engage with our ASEAN counterparts, that we are better engaged and, and by understanding culture, by having uh, a common language, you know, more Americans who can speak the various languages so that we can engage in trade and economic relationships and, and national security relationships and friendships that will make both of our nations stronger. Listen, I've got two daughters. And I refuse to let either one of them grow up in a nation still marred by the same bigotry and violence that has plagued us for too many years. I'm trying to force them to learn Thai. They may have to go to Thai school every Saturday. We all know, <laughs> we all know the experience of having to go to whatever language school that is on Saturdays, but they may be going to language school on Saturdays um, because I feel that it's gonna make them stronger when they grow up, but it's gonna make America stronger when they grow up. It is long, long past time that we break the cycle of discrimination, otherization, alienation. It is long, long past time to stop casting off the AA and HBI community as second class citizens. Um, so while the last two years have been painful, we must remain united. And events like today, where we remain united and present a united front to our allies in ASEAN and in Southeast Asia in general, is a good thing for all of us. Please know that I'm never going to stop advocating for all of our needs in uh, Congress, needs that must be recognized, not just this one month of the year, but every month of the year, if we're going to stop hate against anyone once and for all. So a huge thanks to everyone uh, of you for joining me on the front lines of this struggle. It means the world to me and to so many other Asian and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Americans uh, throughout this great, beautiful, flawed, but always improving and striving to be better country of ours. Thanks for having me here. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you for sharing your heartwarming stories and serving as an inspiration for us all. And thank you for all your efforts on the Hill to, uh, to advance our cause and protect uh, our rights. Um, next, I'd like to turn to Crystal Kai. Crystal is the Executive Director of the White House Initiative uh, for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, or YNP. Uh, she is responsible for advising the Biden administration on the coordination and implementation of federal programs and initiatives to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. Prior to joining YNP, Crystal worked on Capitol Hill for more than a decade, uh, including serving as the executive director of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus for eight years. Crystal was born and raised in Hawaii and is the first Native Hawaiian to ever lead YMP. Crystal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Richard, and um, also a big thank you to Senator Duckworth for those very inspiring remarks. Aloha, everyone, and happy Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. On behalf of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, or what we call WEONP, it's an honor to co-host today's virtual program along with the U.S. Department of State to celebrate the contributions of Southeast Asian Americans. We have an incredible lineup today with remarkable leaders who represent our vibrant Southeast Asian diaspora communities and are living embodiments of the strength and resilience of these communities. According to the 2020 census, we know that Asian Americans continue to be the fastest growing racial population in the country and make up over 7% of the total US population. And according to the group AAPI data, about 7.7 .7 million Americans trace their ancestry back to the 10 countries included in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN. 
And just to give you some perspective, that number is equivalent to the entire population of the state of Washington. So about half of the Southeast Asian American uh, diaspora are first generation immigrants or refugees, which reflects the fact that um, so much of the immigration from the Southeast Asian region actually did not really take off until the 1960s and 70s when wars for forced many who um, had supported the United States as our democratic allies to flee from their homes uh, and nations as refugees to our country. And during this time, we saw that the AA and NHPA population in the United States more than tripled. In fact, in 1960, there were less than 1 million AA and NHPIs living in the United States. But by 1980, there were over 3.5 million. And in 2000, we saw that population increase to over 10 million. And two decades later, here we are today with over 25 um, million Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders living in the United States, according to the 2020 census. And we know that so much of this growth in our diverse AA and NHPI communities has been driven by immigration and by refugees who have brought their adaptability and ambitious amb ambition and hopes and dreams and rich cultural heritage and determination to succeed into their new lives here in America. And in the process, they have benefited and transformed the country that we all share and love. The contributions made by Americans of Southeast Asian ancestry have shaped our history for the better whether it be in the sciences, arts, government, business, or as Olympic gold medalists, we've seen how Southeast Asian Americans have made indelible marks on our country. And we are very fortunate to have luminaries from this community who will be sharing their stories with us today. Like many Asian Americans, Southeast Asian Americans have fought against racism and discrimination that continues to persist in our country today. And while xenophobia and discrimination against Asian Americans is not new, over the past two and a half years of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen an alarming spike in xenophobia and hate crimes directed at Asian Americans, including our most vulnerable um, women and elderly in our communities. We've all heard it, racist rhetoric and accusations, um, blaming us for the virus and telling us to go back home to foreign countries um, that we, we no longer live in um, or have not lived in for, for generations in some cases. And while that is bad enough, we know that we've also seen physical assaults and violent attacks um, against so many within our communities. In fact, according to a study by the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism, the number of reported anti-Asian hate crimes across many of America's largest cities increased by 339% over the past year. And we all know that just last March, um, there was a really horrific incident in Georgia in which a gunman targeted three separate Asian run businesses and killed eight people, including six women of Asian descent. And unfortunately, we are continuing to hear about so many um, violent tragedies impacting our communities on a near daily basis. So this, this needs to stop. We know that the White House and the president and vice president have been very swift to respond to this rise in anti-Asian hate with um, President Biden taking bold action to condemn racism, xenophobia, and intolerance against AA and NHPIs in various presidential documents, speeches, and actions. And this includes through the creation of our White House initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and the President's Advisory Commission on AA and NHPIs, both of which the President um, authorized last May through the signing of Executive Order 14031. And as the Senator mentioned last May, the president also signed into law the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act to ensure that we are doing more to address hate crimes um, impacting Asian Americans and all communities impacted by hate. So we know that together there is still a lot of work to do, but we are very optimistic about the future under this administration who has made it such a priority to ensure that equity is embedded in our whole of government response to advancing equity, justice, and opportunity for AA and NHPIs and all Americans. So thank you again for um, joining us today. And we wanna thank also all of our inspiring leaders and panelists who you will be hearing from shortly who contribute um, so much to this country. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Crystal, for your remarks. Um, again, if you have a question or a comment, we wanna hear from, hear from you, so please put them in the chat box uh, and we will get to uh, addressing them at the end of the program. We really wanna hear from you. Next, I'd like to introduce Erica Moritsugu, Deputy Assistant to the President and Asian American and Pacific Islander Senior Liaison at the White House. Erica works on a wide array of the President's priorities to advance safety, justice, inclusion, and opportunity for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islander communities through a whole of government approach to racial justice. Her past government service includes uh, being Assistant Secretary for Congressional and Intergovernmental Relations at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and she was the first ever Senate Deputy Legislative Director at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. 
the through line of her career in the federal government and politics is fighting for social justice and the empowerment of communities and individuals. And as someone who has seen up close Erica's leadership and effectiveness, I can testify that she and her team have made significant and historic strides in advancing our issues at the White House. Erica, please go ahead. Richard, thank you for that introduction. And thank you to the Department of State um, for your leadership in hosting this important and timely event. I'd like to take a moment to express my thanks and admiration to our guests representing the Southeast Asian American diaspora here in the United States, Dr. Cooley, Dr. Nguyen, Ms. Nguyen, Commissioner Pang, and it includes the extraordinary leader and a personal and professional inspiration of mine, Senator Tammy Duckworth. When we first began planning this event, we thought it would be held earlier in the year, but with the delay, we get the chance to celebrate the accomplishments of our Southeast Asian American heroes and heroines during Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And when I look at the screen of faces zooming in today, I see the rich diversity of the AAN and HPI communities. As you all well know, our community is comprised of individuals tracing roots from more than 20 countries with our own unique histories, cultures, and characteristics, and with over 800 spoken languages and dialects amongst us. And this includes our 10 nations um, that comprise the ASEAN. Today, we have the honor to welcome and engage in a conversation with five prominent and patriotic Americans of Southeast Asian heritage. And by learning about the contributions that our guests and their families made to the United States, we will better understand how diaspora communities can raise awareness here at home about U.S. foreign trade and economic policies towards the ASEAN. And it's these robust people-to-people -people ties to the diaspora community that is one of our American treasures. Today's conversation also demonstrates the United States' commitment to advancing equity and opportunity for AAN and HPIs. Through collaboration with the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders at Crystal Leads with my office, and the President's Advisory Commission on AAN and HPIs, which consists of 25 leaders who reflect the rich diversity of AAN and HPI communities in the United States. We collectively advise the President on ways that the public, private, and nonprofit sectors can work to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for AAN and HPIs. I look forward to today's dialogue and to the chance to learn from you. Mahalo for the opportunity to join you today. Richard, back to you. Thank you so much, Erica, for those words. Let me next turn to my good friend, Dr. Jung Pak, Assistant, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Multilateral Affairs and Global China Issues, to add some context about the close partnership between ASEAN and the United States. Jung? Actually, sorry, prior to arriving at State last year, Dr. Pak was a senior fellow at Brookings Institution, where she focused on East Asia regional dynamics Korean Peninsula Issues and Transnational Threats. While at Brookings, she authored Becoming Kim Jong-un, A Definitive Analysis of North Korea's Leader, which draws from her deep knowledge and experience as an intelligence officer and scholar. Dr. Pak, the floor is yours. Richard, thank you so much. It's such a delight to be here. This is one of the favorite, my favorite parts of the job over here at State. Um, at, at State, uh, as you know, State Department is our government's lead agency on foreign policy. And I wanted to give you a, a quick lay down of where we are on our foreign policy. Um, President Biden has emphasized to all of us the mission of ensuring our foreign policy is fundamentally grounded in the values and interests of all American people. And part of that is doing a better job of communicating to Americans about what our policies are and how they benefit our country. And of course, listening to you and incorporating your ideas into our work. As Richard mentioned uh, at the top, later this week, President Biden will host the leaders of ASEAN for a summit. Um, and despite all that is going on in the world, including, of course, Russia's unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine, the president decided to host this event because we know the importance of ASEAN as a vital partner to the United States. We will not let Russia's horrific actions go unpunished as an international community, but we also won't let them distract us from our diplomatic engagement in the Indo-Pacific region. You may have heard that President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken released the United States Indo-Pacific strategy a few months ago. That strategy discusses how we intend to focus our attention and achieve our objectives in the world's most dynamic and productive region. Our goal is to ensure the Indo-Pacific continues to be free and open and becomes increasingly 
prosperous, secure, connected, and resilient. We think that's in the interests of the people of the region, and even more important, is also in the interests of the United States. Just to give you a few examples of why the Indo-Pacific matters to us here in the United States, 60% of global maritime trade passes through Asia. So keeping those sea lanes open and free is vital to our economic strength and, the, and to jobs for Americans. Similarly, growing the markets of the Indo-Pacific countries will generate demand for our world-class goods and services, creating opportunities for economic growth and prosperity. And of course, our forward deployed US military personnel stationed in ally and partner countries throughout the Indo-Pacific keep us safer here at home as that of our allies. That goes to the first and in many ways, the most important of the advantages the United States has in our leadership role in the world. We are not alone. We are part of a strong and globe spanning framework of alliances and partnerships based on shared values, mutual interests, and deep, relate, deep friendships. That includes our five treaty alliances in Asia, two of which are with ASEAN member states, the Philippines and Thailand, as well as all our many bilateral partnerships. It includes the Quad with the US, Japan, India, and Australia. And it also includes, crucially, our longstanding commitment to ASEAN centrality. One of the Biden-Harris administration's top priorities is to serve as a strong, reliable partner and to strengthen an, an empowered and unified ASEAN to address the challenges of our time. That is why today's event is also designed to emphasize the vital role that Americans of Southeast Asian heritage have as we continue to deepen our ties with allies and partners of ASEAN. All of you are cultural ambassadors, as well as embodiments of the American values of diversity and inclusion, and of the opportunities which are available in a democratic and meritocratic society. We acknowledge this has not always been the case in the United States. Um, and that we're still grappling with the legacies of racism and institutional bias. But we are approaching these challenges with honesty and humility and with deep determination to achieve inclusivity and equality for everyone in our society. That message is particularly important in places where people do not have the same human rights and freedoms as Americans enjoy places where free speech and free assembly are rejected by authoritarian leaders, or where minority ethnic or religious groups may experience official discrimination. I'm also well, of, well, well aware of concerns that US policies, which acknowledge our ongoing competition with the People's Republic of China, may be flaming the fans of discrimination against all Asian Americans. We are committed to both combating racism here at home and abroad, while also competing with our adversaries when necessary. We need to build the guardrails to ensure our rhetoric doesn't lead to discrimination here at home, while also elevating AA and NHPI voices in those discussions and working with civil society. I'll conclude with thanks to all our speakers and our audience members today. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to meet you all and share in this great event. Thank you so much, uh, Das Pak, for that. Uh, and uh, thanks for giving us an overview of uh, the relationship between the US and ASEAN. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to introduce our other distinguished guests. Uh, but before we do that, I'm told that, unfortunately, Senator Duckworth has to leave early. Uh, so I just wanted to give her, again, the opportunity to thank, to thank you, Senator, and, and see if you had any uh, parting words for us before you left. Um, well, just thank you for letting me be here. We're very much interested in my office and making sure that we support a greater engagement in Southeast Asia, um, uh, in particular with the ASEAN nations. I think it couldn't be more important than right now when you see what's happening uh, around the world uh, for the United States to be reinforcing our commitment to the region. Um, so I couldn't agree more with everything that Dr. Pak just, just mentioned in her statements. And thank you everybody for being here and feel free to reach, reach out to me anytime if I can be a partner in this issue. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Senator. Thanks for joining us. 
Uh, and with that, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce some exceptional Americans and learn a little bit more from each of them about their own stories and how they have achieved such impressive things. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sarai Ram Kwei. Dr. Kwei was born in Cambodia. And when, when she was two years old, her family escaped from the Khmer Rouge, eventually making their way to the United States. She has since become the first female Cambodian refugee to work as a surgeon in the United States. Dr. Kwei is currently Associate Chief of Staff at the Michael DeBakey Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Texas, as well as a writer, researcher, and healthcare executive. Dr. Kwei, can I ask you to tell us a little bit about your family story? Thank you so much, Richard. And uh, first off, thank you so much to the White House and the President and the State Department and Senator Duckworth for, for this opportunity to share my experiences as an American, as an Asian American, and as a Cambodian American. This is such an incredible honor to be able to share my story. Um, as you mentioned, I was born in Cambodia in 1978, and it was in the middle of the Cambodian genocide known as the Killing Fields. And during that time that I was born, Anyone who was educated was targeted for execution. That meant the teachers, the doctors, the nurses, the artists, the musicians. And my mother, who was a school teacher, she had to hide her identity for four years as she fought every single day to keep my sister and me alive. Um, when I was about two years old, as you mentioned, we escaped from Cambodia seeking hope, seeking freedom, and just seeking a chance to build a life. Uh, we made it uh, to a refugee camp across the border, and we thought, we're finally safe. We're, we're finally free. But about a week after we arrived in the camp, we were injured during a bombing. And my mom had massive bleeding and massive abdominal injuries. Uh, for me, my, my left ear was partially torn off and I have a scar now that goes from my scalp and down the side of my left face. And uh, fortunately, there was a volunteer Red Cross surgeon in the camp who operated on my mom and operated on me and saved both of our lives. And by the grace of God, we were sponsored to the United States by a Christian missionary organization. And we started our new life in Carvallis, Oregon, where my mom worked as a housekeeper at Good Samaritan Hospital, and my father worked as a janitor at Oregon State University. The, the story of how my family became Americans, it began when I was very young, but this story has been the fabric of my history. And one thing that my mom has always ingrained in me from very early is that you've been blessed with so much and with that, you have the responsibility to make sure that you use, use those blessings to make it better for others. And um, I remember that I'm alive when 3 million other people died in that genocide. I get to live in this country of freedom as an American. And even though I was born at a time when doctors were targeted for execution, today, I have the freedom to work as a surgeon caring for our US veterans. My mom mopped floors in the operating room and today, I perform robotic operations in the OR. And I have to say, only in America is that possible. I am so, so proud to be an American. And I'm grateful for the incredible opportunities that I've had. I'm grateful for the, for the compassion that I've experienced. And I think most partly, I'm grateful for the freedom that I have to live and to work and to grow and to give. Um, I'm also proud of my heritage as Khmer. And my history as a part of the Khmer people, a people who've gone through such suffering, but they have come out with so much resilience, so much compassion, and so much courage. And remembering my mom's words, I spent my career for the past uh, several decades as a public servant. Um, I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to care for U.S. veterans over the past two decades, from working in the OR, fixing hernias and removing colon cancers and treating ruptured appendicitis to serving in leadership roles. Um, I had the opportunity previously to serve as Deputy Undersecretary for Community Care for the Department of Veterans Affairs and Special Advisor to the Secretary. I've had the opportunity to take care of low-income pregnant women and children and our uh, indigent disabled Americans during my time as Chief Medical Officer for Louisiana Medicaid. But one thing, regardless of what role I've been in, whether as a doctor at the bedside or as a health policy leader, I've always remembered that it's about the mission. 
That's why we're here. Everything we do needs to make an impact. It needs to make our communities better. And we need to make sure that what we do makes our communities better in a meaningful way. And for me, that's how I tried to live out what my mom taught me, that with the blessings that I've been given, I have to make my community better. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity to share my story. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwe, for sharing your real heartwarming story. Um, so uh, we have over 100 people joining us in the chat uh, and, and, uh, from around the world and from the United States. Uh, we see someone joining us from Ottawa. We want to hear for, where you're from. So if you're uh, tuning in from an interesting place, please put it in the chat box and we'll uh, uh, give you a shout out. Uh, but we still want to see your questions and comments. Uh, we see a couple of questions already rolling in uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get some more interesting conversations and comments so we get a good discussion going uh, during the Q&A. Uh, our next guest is Simon Pong. Simon is originally from Singapore and came to the United States in 1989. He is the executive vice president and co-founder of Royal Business Bank and also serves as the president of the U.S. Sino Friendship Association and is a member of President Biden's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Commissioner Pong, like many Southeast Asian Americans, you are a U.S. citizen by choice. Can you please tell us why you chose to immigrate from Singapore and your experiences as a naturalized U.S. citizen? Thank you, Richard. Thank you for this honor to be here uh, with all the distinguished, um, I would say, VVVVIP here to share um, our experience, uh, my experience. Uh, as mentioned that I am from Singapore, uh, I think beside the weather, Singapore weather is very hot and humid. But, you know, I live in California, it's nice. But that's not the main reason I'm here. The reason I'm here is because uh, this is a country with opportunities that I never, never thought that I can start uh, as part of the co-founder of a bank in Southern California. We gather all the resources and all the capital from uh, the community, uh, people from Taiwan, from Singapore, Malaysia, China. So we started off this bank with uh, barely $71 million. And we grow until today is a $4.5 billion bank. It's still a community bank, but I'm glad to be part of it. This is a success uh, story. Um, as a banker, we deal with a lot of uh, um, customers, uh, a well diverse customer. And initially, uh, we deal with a lot of uh, business people from, uh, I would say, ASEAN country, you know, uh, from Cambodia, uh, from Vietnam, from uh, China, from Singapore, Malaysia, all over the world. And the reason for that is because these are the people who are looking for financing for their small business. And then we have been backing up the, uh, all their uh, effort to you know to do a better job here, and one of the things that uh, we from the uh, from the interaction with the customer, then I I began to realize that well you know we need to have a voice um, among us so that we can communicate with the administration uh, effect, more effectively. Uh, being an Asian, uh, a lot of them are very reserved; they don't want to speak up. And, and the, I think the, the big thing worse is they do not know who to they contact with. So that is why that I've become very, very um, active in participating in a numerous, uh, uh, I would say that uh, community um, with, the, with the mainstream, you know, so that we can, uh, I can represent them or I can voice for them. And, you know, another thing about this country is, um, uh, I, this is a good, uh, this is a free country. I have three adult daughters who are um, uh, raised here. And one of them is born here, the youngest one. Uh, they are very successful in their field of study. Uh, they are successful because this country gives them a lot of opportunities. And I'm very happy where they are right now today. And just like um, Senator Tammy mentioned something, you know, we, I also send my, my kids to the Chinese school almost every Saturday when they are, when they are like four or six years old. And also I'm very active in the Chinese school. The reason for that because 
when their kids they see that dad always go to to the Chinese school every Saturday, there must be something very important. So they also they committed, and I'm very glad today that they can uh, speak uh, Mandarin. You know, at the same time, uh, because my family is from uh, my father and my grandfather from uh, China, from Hainan Island. So occasionally, I also speak to them in the Hainanese dialect. They appreciate it. When they grow up, they really appreciate it. And, um, you know, uh, this is a, a great country to, to grow our kids. And um, they are very dependent and very outspoken. I'm very glad because I can compare the, when they are uh, socializing with uh, my, my nieces, my, you know, all their kids in Singapore. They are very, very outspoken. And I love it because this is the way it should be, especially they are women. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Simon, so much for sharing your story. Appreciate it. Um, it's my pleasure next to introduce Amanda Nguyen. Amanda is the CEO and co-founder of RIDES, a nonprofit civil rights organization which fights for the rights of sexual assault survivors. In 2016, she celebrated a major victory when President Obama signed the Sexual Assault Survivors' Rights Act into law helping to craft the legislation which reforms the handling of sexual assault evidence collection kits on the federal level was her way of fighting back after learning in 2013 that her own rape kit was set to be destroyed. Amanda, your story is one of refusing to accept injustice and seems rooted in your family's strength. I understand your mother was the first woman from her rural village in Vietnam to go to college when she came to the United States as a refugee when Saigon fell. Do you think you learned your bravery from her? Absolutely. And it's such a pleasure to be here with incredible people. Um, yeah, when people ask me how I founded RISE and how I drafted and passed this law uh, unanimously, I think about my mother. Um, she was the first woman in her rural village in Vietnam to be accepted into college in Shigong. And during her time, um, it wasn't so honorable to go to higher education, to leave the family. She was one out of 12 siblings. It was um, expected of her, especially being a, a younger woman, to stay and help the family. And so her father, my grandpa, found her books um, and started burning them. But as he was burning them, he saw that the awards that she had gotten um, and hid from him were falling out of the pages of the book. And he was really heartbroken that she had kept all of her success from him. And he decided to let her go to college instead. Um, unfortunately, she never got to graduate because uh, Shai Gong fell. And... Um, Actually, one of her professors that she was a TA for, a teacher's assistant for, um, was a uh, intelligence um, asset to the United States government and had given her the opportunity to evacuate with him the night before Shai Gong fell. And she decided that she would uh, make the choice to return to her rural village in Vietnam instead of taking a ticket out and that was because she wanted to save her family too. When she came back to her village, um, you know, her family was really involved in the military and so many things were taken away and, and they made a plan um, of the 12 siblings, four of them would be chosen to make the escape and she volunteered to go. Uh, she um, first actually they uh, paid for people to help private contractors to get them out. But when they came, um, they found a origami paper boat. And on this um, note was uh, a uh, message that this was actually the boat they were le leaving on. So they actually were cheated out of the money. But it was a good thing for them because all of the people that were on that first boat they were supposed to be on um, were killed. And so this set back my family uh, several years. My uncle pretended to be a fisherman and uh, they chose a rainy day to try to escape. 
Um, they swam a quarter mile out to the boat. And as they were trying to speed out of the harbor on this stormy night, um, they heard the machine guns pierce around their boat and the water was splashing on them mixed with the rain and um, the guards had caught them. Now, a lot of refugees carry gold with them, you know, because uh, it transfers values across border lines. And um, very fortunate for them at that moment, another refugee boat was also trying to escape. And so the guards, through the speaker microphone, said, you guys stay here and we're going to go get them and we're going to go back for you. And my mother turned to her brother, the captain of the boat, and said, it's do or die. We have to try to escape. And so they did. Um, and long story short, they were caught in a tidal wave storm. Their boat sank. Um, and my mother says that these waves were like skyscrapers. You feel like an ant um, with Mother Nature. And also, in another stroke of luck, a ship came by, a really big one, and saved them. But because that ship was much bigger than their tiny refugee boat, in that tidal wave storm, there was one rope that was thrown over. And everyone had to climb that one rope um, from that refugee boat onto the bigger ship, a literal lifeline. And she says that the lesson is that no matter how scary it is, the faith in what lies ahead is better than what you're standing on right now is what gave her the courage to, to go and climb that literal lifeline. And so when I think about this, um, I learned that courage is not the lack of fear, but having it, but going through and doing it anyways. Now, I think there's a long tradition of people taking their painful living truths and channeling that into justice. And so I joined that tradition by penning my own rights, fighting for rape survivors. Um, when my mother got here, I heard from others who are similar. She also worked any job that she could. She held a broom so that I could hold a pen in my hand and rewrite the laws not only for my community, but also for other Americans as well. Um, and so I, I think that I'm so proud of hearing all these incredible other stories today because I join this very American tradition of making our country a more perfect union by living up to the better angels of our nature and the promise of this experiment, which is that no matter where you're from, no matter who you are, we belong. So much, Amanda. Um, such an incredible story. And thank you for sharing the stories of your mother uh, and, and her life lessons. Um, again, we have uh, a lot of people joining us uh, from around the world. Uh, we want to hear from, your, from you. Uh, please continue to put questions uh, and comments in the chat box. We see a lot of them already coming through. Uh, and thank you for joining us. We see someone joining us from Jerusalem, uh, a foreign service officer based there uh, at our uh, U.S. Embassy. Thank you for your service, Tina. Uh, and where else uh, are people uh, tuning in from? We want to hear from you and give you a shout out. So, Our next special guest is Dr. Mosey Wynn from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. A renowned scholar and engineer, Dr. Wynn, also the founding director of MIT's Wireless Information and Network Sciences Laboratory. Dr. Wynn, can you share with us a little of your story? How did you go from growing up in Burma to becoming a world famous scientist at one of America's premier educational institutions? Also, I know you have, uh, you've you been active in promoting diversity within the STEM community there. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about your efforts in that area as well? Thanks. Dr. Wynn, I believe you're muted. Oh. Thank you, you everyone for having me here. Um, it's uh, very delightful to be here and it's a fantastic day. The first day that really starting to warm up in Massachusetts. So it's all coincide with this. Uh, 
just um, a little bit of my background. Um, I grew up in the Shan Hills of Burma. Uh, this is uh, sort of uh, towards the uh, Thai border. And uh, I grew up with my grandparents there um, for uh, um, sometimes. The town was uh, small, about uh, 20,000 people. I finally had a chance to go back. And when I went back, it was uh, half a million. It's very big and crowded now. Um, so I moved here in uh, when I was around 18. The first opportunity that I had to leave and join my mother, who had been in the US for uh, quite some time. Um, and uh, we all came here uh, because uh, this is the land of opportunities. You had heard from a number of people in front of me. Uh, we are able to do things and accomplish um, um, our goals and, and uh, only here uh, possible in this country. One more thing that I would add is that uh, here, you also have a multiple chance and multiple opportunities just in case you miss first time or second time. And in many places, uh, uh, around the world, you have one chance. You better be in a great shape the day that you take that big exam. And if you are sick that day, your life is over. But here, you have multiple chances to try. So this is something that I would like to add to from based on what I hear. Um, you know, the main reason that I got into uh, doing uh, science and education is that when I first arrived here, I don't speak much English. Uh, uh, the only thing that I can really understand is math, uh, and that, that's the only thing that it makes sense. So I started spending more time uh, reading and uh, doing more math. Uh, in fact, my family wanted me to be a medical doctor, and that's probably not uncommon in the background that I came from. But I wanted to do math, so we sort of took a compromise and uh, many of you will, uh, um, you know, agree with me that, you know, most of us uh, do sort of what our parents want us to do. So for my case, I was able to uh, make a compromise because I didn't speak much English and I was able to understand math. And that's sort of how I got into doing uh, science and engineering. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, like uh, um, a lot of us, uh, we have uh, different kind of challenges. For me, one of the most uh, uh, missing part in my career is that that there are not enough heroes uh, from my background in the field. So when we go to school, the, there's very few people to look up to, and that that was a challenge. And you know, being able to cope with uh, learning the language as well as the subject is another challenge. But all of these are just, relatively speaking, uh, is something that one can overcome. And uh, if you uh, have a passion, if you are committed, uh, you're able to achieve goals. And 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 that's sort of what we thought it would be, and it turned out to be. The, the way we think uh, what uh, America and what the United States is all about. Um, so I, this is what I would like to share. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Nguyen, um, for your encouraging words uh, and advice. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to uh, get to ask your questions and comments. We see uh, a number of them already in the chat box. Uh, our team has um, uh, put them uh, uh, for us to ask. Um, so if, if you have any more questions or comments, please continue to put them in. We have um, uh, a, a good amount of time uh, left in the program. So we want to ensure that we get to as many questions as possible uh, and hear from, uh, from our, from our uh, distinguished panel of experts and our guests. So uh, let me get to our first question. Uh, and this one is actually for all of our uh, uh, our representatives, our guests who are joining us representing the various diaspora communities, um, our distinguished Americans. 
Uh, we've heard from, we've heard about the ASEAN summit coming up this week, uh, thanks to Dr. Pak's um, description of it. As Americans with ties to ASEAN countries, what messages would you like to send to ASEAN's leaders? Uh, what do you hope that they take away from the meeting with the president and our leadership? Uh, so uh, maybe I can ask uh, Dr. Dr. Koy to go first. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I, I think for me, the, the biggest message I would say uh, to, to the leaders of ASEAN nations and to the leader of uh, the United States, our President Biden, is that there's so much power and collaboration. I've seen that over and over throughout my career, that truly nothing is impossible when we come together in our humanity and we remember the mission of making our community, making our global world better, there is so much power and collaboration. And there's so much richness in the cultures that we can bring together and, and do better than, than the sum of our parts. Thank you so much. Uh, how about you, Amanda? Do you have a, a message for ASEAN's leaders? Well, I just want to echo what's been said. I think collaboration is absolutely key. And I also um, want to say that I'm so deeply proud of our heritage, um, of our diaspora all around the world, and um, that uh, I, I hope that this collaboration um, just continues to grow. Thank you so much. How about you, Simon? Um, I I should say that among the ASEAN country, um, together with the U.S., is to work on the common ground on issues um, in two areas: uh, education, uh, to collaborate on the, uh, uh, the students, and also innovations, uh, which is very lacking, in my opinion, um, in the ASEAN country. These are the two areas I think that should further uh, collaborate on that. That's great. I'm glad you brought up uh, those two efforts too. Um, we hopefully will have some deliverables uh, from the ASEAN summit that we'll announce in those issues. Uh, don't want to spoil it, but stay tuned. Hey, Thank Richard, you. could I just yeah. could I jump in there? Um, really, unless, the, unless there are other um, comments from our uh, from our guests. Um, the you know we're really excited for the summit that's going to be later this week, um, and the the president and Secretary Blinken are extremely um, happy that this is finally happening, and and we at state have been uh, really uh, you know pedal to the metal um, in 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 uh, planning, uh, logistics, the policies, and and um, the various things that are related to the summit. So really, we're all very really jazzed about about all of this, um, you know. And I think that uh, we're yeah, I mean we're celebrating 45 years of U.S. ASEAN ties. Um, but we see also see this summit as as moving forward as well, um, and you know we're celebrating the the past forty five years, but we're also looking forward and trying to tackle as as many of our guests have said together um, the challenges of the twentieth twenty first century. So we're looking at climate action, we're looking at pandemic recovery, we're looking at maritime cooperation. Um, and as well as economic cooperation and clean energy transformation. So we're, you know, these are these are big issues that can't be solved alone by any one country. So we're really looking forward to um, to expanding our relationship, deepening our relationship with the ASEAN countries, and really um, facing head on these these challenges that affect us all. Right. Thank you for sharing that, uh, John. Dr. Wynn, do you have anything uh, that you'd like to ask uh, ASEAN's leaders? Yes, uh, I would like to do that. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to make a, a little bit more uh, focused, narrow uh, uh, request uh, or a message to the, the leaders. Uh, I think Burma is now going through uh, quite a difficult time. And uh, I would like uh, to see that uh, US and ASEAN countries uh, work uh, together to make a more peaceful place and more uh, safer place, safer fields, safer villages, safer cities, where uh, you know new generation have a basic access to a decent education. Every child be prepared to go to college. Every one of those that has go to college, some percent of them will be prepared to go to 
further study graduate school and so on. And I'm not uh, talking about, you know, very costly uh, school system with flashy equipment. I'm just talking about something very basic fundamentals that doesn't cost a whole lot, but people, it will make people life uh, a big difference as, as they go forward. So that would be my request. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Nguyen. Let, let me ask a follow-up question in that regard, and I'll, I won't call on each and every one of you, but you know, if you have any, any, anything to share, it, what would you like to, to share a message uh, for President Biden or any of the US government leaders that are gonna be attending uh, the ASEAN Special Summit? Anything you'd like to see the US continue to do uh, do differently, uh, what, kind, what kind of support, what message would you have for us as uh, members of the State Department and the U.S. government who are um, uh, trying earnestly to strengthen the U.S. ASEAN relationship? I'll just throw that open to anybody who wants to answer. I'd be happy to start, Richard. Please. So, so I would say, first off, um, uh, to President Biden, we have such an incredible history of leadership of, of the United States and Americans leading globally uh, uh, and a huge, huge history of compassion and humanity. And I, I think continuing that tradition and upholding it and growing it, of uh, leading with humanity and compassion, that, that that truly has so much power to, to make our global community better. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, let's go to uh, our next question. This question is actually for, um, for Dr. Pak. Uh, this is a question from Abraham. And he asks, can you talk a little bit about how the United States is contributing to ASEAN development through the Department of Commerce to build critical economic ties and to develop defense relationships in support of America's foreign policy goals? Maybe you can put this in the context of our Indo-Pacific strategy. Thanks um, for that question, Abraham. Um, you know, I think the the relationship with with the ASEAN countries, you know, as as a as a group, um, as well as bilaterally, um, covers all of those areas that you mentioned, um, spanning from defense, security, um, to economic, as well as people to people. Um, last uh, October, when President Biden uh, participated in the U.S. ASEAN summit. Um, he announced uh, over $100 million of, of new initiatives that span all of those things that, that we mentioned on things like transportation, um, energy transformation, people as well as people to people ties and, and digital economy. Um, and I wanna, and as well as education. So, um, so you know, the, 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 the ties are the deepening of this relationship um, touch every aspect of those in the recognition that um, that you know we can't have uh, economic prosperity without secu without security um, in a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, and our relationship with ASEAN and the things that we're trying to do with ASEAN are is is nested within our greater Indo-Pacific strategy that that aims to do all of that: a, a, a secure, a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, economic development and prosperity for all, as well as um, as well as resilience, uh, resilience of all of our allies and partners. So, um, so I'm really happy to be a part. I'm really proud to be a part of that um, that Indo-Pacific strategy and really helping the administration propel that strategy forward um, bilaterally as well as collectively uh, through our ASEAN friends. Great, thank you so much for sharing that. And I also just want to add, um, you know, last week uh, I had the opportunity to hear, along with my colleague, the Acting Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy, Liz Allen, from our um, colleagues in Southeast Asia who represent their, the young leaders there. They're, they're part of a group called Waisili, uh, which is the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative, uh, and they represent the largest group of young leaders uh, that the State Department um, supports and organizes. And we heard from them about what they see the future of the U.S. ASEAN relationship is. And they said exactly that, Zhang, that they want to see uh, more attention to helping build resilience, resiliency uh, among uh, ASEAN member states. 
uh, creating economic opportunities and incentives for empowerment uh, and, and ways to, uh, to lift up communities, uh, particularly at the economic and commercial level. As much as it really is uh, important to, to, to follow a lot of the political developments, we talked a lot about what's going on in Burma uh, with the continued, um, uh, uh, effort, uh, the continued uh, activities there uh, that, that, that uh, remain troubling. Um, and things that are going on in Russia, Ukraine, which a lot of those uh, young leaders are following, um, they still uh, see the United States as an engine of, of economic opportunity um, for those uh, in remaining in their country. So uh, hopefully uh, economic uh, and commercial issues will be uh, talked about predominantly at this week's um, ASEAN Special Summit. So thanks for sharing that. Um, let's go to our next question, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, from one of our uh, viewers. As a Cambodian-American woman who has had the privilege of working for the State Department for over 20 years, I have seen only a handful of Cambodian-Americans join the State Department during my time. For Dr. Quay, how would you encourage the younger generation of Southeast Asian-Americans to consider a career in public service, would it would? Uh, let me ask you first, Dr. Quay, and then I'll ask our other distinguished panelists to add anything to that. Thank you, Richard, and thank you to the listener for that question. I think it's a great question, not just to us as Southeast Asian Americans, but to all Americans. What can we do to serve? What can we do as public servants? And I, I think the fact that we live in this incredible country, we have so much opportunity. It's an incredible blessing. I, I, I know I feel very blessed. And I think that we start small and then you go big. You start in your communities. You start in your schools. You start in your neighborhoods and you see what can you do to serve your communities and make it better and that grows i i know my first job out um, as a staff surgeon it was at this tiny little rural uh, va hospital in shreveport louisiana and when i started there um, this story is that um, we were close to being shut down because we had had so many challenges and we didn't have a lot of resources but we had a lot of good people a lot of people who cared passionately about taking care of our veterans and providing the best quality care. And over the period of a year, we went from being an outlier for um, concerning things, for things that we were concerned about, like, uh, and, and, and we went from a year of working with no extra resources to being an outlier for having one of the best outcomes in the country. And so why I tell that story is that you don't have to wait till things are perfect. You don't have to wait till you have a fancy title or you have a bunch of staff or a lot of resources. You start with what you know and keep working at it. And so going back to the question of public service encouraging our young people, I couldn't think of anything more noble than to, to, to serve your fellow humankind. So I absolutely encourage all young Khmer Americans all young Southeast Asian Americans, all young Americans to ask, what can I do to serve my community, to serve, to serve my country? Great, thank you so much for answering that. And thank you, uh, Leaks Me, for asking the question. Uh, our next question uh, is for Erica. Uh, Erica, you spoke earlier about the White House's focus on AANHPI issues. Let me ask you uh, what AANHPI issues in particular will the White House be focusing on in the upcoming months? Thanks. Thanks. And one of the great things about um, the creation of my position this time last year, even though it's first ever and maybe a little bit overdue to have somebody in the West Wing um, focused exclusively and intensively on the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities, is that it is actually um, an honor to execute on the commitment that our president and our vice president have had long before they were sworn in. And so I get to execute and build on it in a time that I think is an inflection point for our communities and our nation um, with the kind of focal, focal point um, for us and for broader dominant culture society, um, given the crisis that our communities face and in a very acute way. So the triple threat, the triple pressures of what has um, focused our attention on during the pandemic with the public health crisis, which highlights the health disparities and systemic um, disparities that have long existed in our communities, um, the 
epidemic and pandemic of hate and violence against people who are visibly othered, um, and the economic effects, honestly. I mean, if you look at the crisis that the pandemic wrought um, nationwide, um, you know, the folks who are on the front line of it were our small business owners in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities, um, both because of the services that they provide and where they are, but also because of the combination of the public health crisis and the rise and voice and demonstration of anti-Asian hate and violence. And so that's obviously the, the issue of the moment. I mean, we're at an acute crisis point there. And, you know, preserving safety, physical and emotional and mental health safety for our community members um, who are suffering so much um, in, in different ways than, than other Americans is obviously top of mind um, as we, you know, proceed to, to look to address anti-Asian hate and xenophobia. And it begins with, you know, from the top, um, week one, um, after he was sworn in, the president signed a presidential memorandum condemning, making making clear that it was the position of the American government, of the U.S. government, to condemn racism, xenophobia, and intolerance against Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. It followed on with the executive order that Crystal spoke about so eloquently before in the signing of the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. And with all of that, as we implement those pieces, we also peel back layers of how long standing some of the seemingly intra intractable issues for our communities have been. The model minority myth and um, the perpetual foreigner myth that imbues every Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders experience as Americans um, also points to some of the institutional and systemic problems that have been riddled um, throughout our government institutions and private sector institutions and community. Um, and so we also get to look at some of those pieces of it with respect to language access, the granularity of data, and the way that we look at the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities and all of its richness and diversity. But within that richness and diversity are differences. And we need to name those differences and honor those differences and celebrate those differences, but also tend to them, too, because it is, as I think um, our guest speakers have talked about, the collective power of collaboration that brings us together and helps to empower us, um, but without naming the differences and noticing them, we're not we're not really tending to the folks who should be centered at the end of, I guess I would I would say for non state department um, colleagues in the in the federal family, um, you know at the end of our service spectrum, right? Um, and so we get to do the long term work that's built into this crisis moment that we're in. Um, it's not the work of a day. It's been hard, and it's important to keep trying. And we've got so many partners to do. We don't, I mean, none of us do it alone. Um, we partner across the interagency. Um, I have the help and collaboration of every component within the White House, including every single policy council. And, of course, with civil society and um, the nonprofit sectors and community leaders at all levels of elected and, and volunteer leadership. These are the kinds of things that are part of the command of 14 policy areas that the president outlined in Executive Order 14031 um, that we are making progress on, that we're very proud of, um, and that we will continue striving for. All right, thank you so much, Erica. Um, appreciate it. If I may echo. Please, go ahead. Um, I'd like to echo what Erica said um, um, just now. You know, we as um, uh, one of the, I mean, we are, I'm part of the 25 commissioner in the ANHPI. Uh, without going to um, further detail, we have numerous, um, we have discussed a lot of topics, and this will be uh, uh, discussed and presented uh, in the coming days uh, um, in, uh, to the president and also to the co-chair and chair. And that one will be uh, will be shared with everybody. It will be public. Am, am I right to say this, Erica? Right. So um, the, there are numerous areas that we, we address. I, I think I totally agree with Erica. What she mentioned is that we encourage everyone, and also Dr. Quick, to to participate in the community. You know, and also go to your uh, uh, your contact person, your legislator. All right. I'm not as a lobbyist, but at least to communicate with them. This is what my belief is, because I, I always say that I pay respect to a lot of uh, um, elected officials. Uh, they, they could be better off in the private sector, but they choose to serve the community. So a lot of them, 
they will, they will come a lot of dialogue and um, this is uh, over years. I mean, it will not just fly overnight, you know, that you have to build uh, your dialogue uh, cumulatively and as a team effort, we can have a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else want to share? Okay. Um, we're seeing some great uh, conversations going on in the chat box. Uh, thanks for keeping that coming. Particularly, I love the conversation about Wysili, uh and some of the activities that uh, you all are doing to host Wysili groups, uh, Wysili fellows, uh, and uh, that really is the, 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 the thrust of our people-to-people -people engagement is not necessarily how, what governments are doing for young people overseas, but what uh, Americans like yourselves are doing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, our next question is from Edward. Uh, he's asking, how do we balance our rightful emphasis and pride in our heritage while at the same time addressing concerns from some fellow Americans that our loyalties are divided? According to one survey, some 33% polled believe Asian Americans are more loyal to their country of origin than to the United States. Clearly, this is not solely the responsibility of A and HPIs, but what can our communities do to help build these bridges of understanding. Uh, Dr. Wynn, let me ask you first. That's a hard question. Um, I, the statistics are even harder because it's, you know, how the statistics are gathered. I, I teach statistics here, so I'll, I'll start by saying that, but I can just tell you from my point of view, um, my, uh, I'm not divided. Uh, I, you know, I think of myself as American and, uh, and, uh, that's where, the, uh, where my allegiance is. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, uh, I have to go against my own roots. I think it's all a common ground. And uh, I think the the meeting that, uh, about to happen also in Washington is, it's, it's what it's about, how to come to a consensus and, uh, um, and uh, hold each other's hand and do a better, better uh, do the uh, good for the better world and a better region and better universe. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? Uh, Sri Ram, Amanda. Sure, Richard, thank you. And I think that's an excellent question. I think it's something that all of us as Asian Americans who are first generation or many generations in um, have experienced. And I, I think for me, as, as for my family, I, I'm so proud to be an American. There's no question about uh, loyalty or, or, or allegiance. I, I'm just an American. That's, that's what I know deep in my bones. But I'm equally proud of my heritage just like my Irish American friends are very proud of their Irish uh, American heritage or my Swedish American her Americans are proud of their heritage. Um, I, I think um, we don't need to uh, uh, dismiss our heritage while being proud of our, our country as Americans. Um, and I, I don't know how to answer the naysayers. I just can only live my life uh, with uh, service to my community service to my country and um, with pride in, in my background. Yeah, I'm also happy to add on to here. I used to serve in the State Department um, and I know that my you know fellow colleagues, um, Congressman Andy Kim has also talked about how sometimes um, we'd come to meetings and people would ask, oh, like what country are you here from? And we're like, we're Americans. So I don't think it's on us at all. This has to do with the perpetual foreigner stereotype. And we don't have to prove anything. Even if we weren't in service, we still belong here. You know, I think that is the most authentic way to be an American, which is just to be. Um, and I, I know that the question and also these feelings come you know, from, yes, a complicated place, but also um, I, I want to let people know that uh, we do belong. Um, and it is on our allies, people from other communities as well, to help with um, getting, you know, people to understand what these stereotypes are and how hurtful they can be. I would like to add, uh, Richard, 
Um, <clears throat> I used my three adult daughters as an example. Two of them are raised here, where they came here at the age of two and four, and the youngest one, uh, you know, is born here. And they always say that, that, you know, how grateful that we have the Singapore background because the, the culture and things like this. So when our American friend asking us about certain area, that anything that we can help, we always help them. So this, I will apply this to where I am uh, today. Um, I, as an example, because of our background, I'm from Singapore. If anything that we can help to, I would say bridge is a big word, you know, for the two countries, but at least uh, as an example, if, um, if the State Department or even the White House, uh, they have a certain uh, concern or questions, uh, we can be uh, resourceful in the sense that we can say, oh, this is our opinion. You know, I mean, uh, this is the way I look at it in, uh, in general. But regardless, the, we are Americans. And uh, I'm naturalized here. I'm a U.S. citizen. I have to make sure that our country is doing well. I don't want to travel anywhere else in the whole Asia. They look at that. Oh, a new American only do want to do this, do that, control the everything that other people do, you know. But I always, you must have, uh, the sense of belonging, I, I, I don't think uh, we are loyal to the country, okay? But I always like to uh, use uh, Lee Sien Long uh, from Singapore. He always said that um, all the countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, have to find a common ground to work with the U.S. And at this moment, if let's say that um, the U.S. and China, the two big countries, uh, like have any uh, disagreement, they always have to sit down to find an agreement to work together. Otherwise, the whole Southeast Asia will be uh, uh, not very, I would say that the people are not very comfortable because uh, people always look at Southeast Asia that, you know, uh, I, I, I re remember um, recently there's a campaign, one of the legislator um, mentioned that, oh, um, the Chinese steal all the jobs, you know, that become a problem, you know. Uh, for for the like Asian hate crime, uh, what I'm trying to say is that we have to really make sure that we communicate this um, with um, people that we know, and also at the same time we bring this one out to uh, the less later and you know, to uh, their attention. I mean, this is my my two cents. Thank you so much, Simon. Anyone else want to share anything? Um, I can't underscore enough what Amanda said about yeah. um, the perpetual foreignness, um, that kind of perception of dual identity. And, and Richard, you know this, I come from this, uh, my, my degree in U.S. history um, speaking, um, and it's, it, it's, and it's that kind of, uh, the perception of dual lo loyalty is deeply rooted, uh, rooted um, in the perception of otherness that somehow Asians, Asian Americans are not American enough. Um, and it speaks more about the person who is talking about um, otherness and dual identities um, or accusations of dual identities more than it says anything about the, the, the Asian American or, or of anybody from a different um, uh, looking heritage or, or culture. So, um, you know, I would reject that wholeheartedly of dual identities. We're, we all have multiple identities um, and it's no one's business um, what identity you are or you aren't. Um, and and from, a, from a national security and foreign policy perspective, that's what makes us stronger um, as a country um, and in our outward look and in our outward face um, and in our willingness and, uh, and our drive to cooperate and collaborate with, with all of our allies and partners um, and other countries. So, um, that's what that's what makes us stronger. Um, that's what makes us so attractive as a country. Um, the fact that um, that you have uh, people from different ethni ethnicities and cultures sitting on the U.S. side of the table um, in so many instances. Richard, you know this. We've been on that on that side of the table. Um, so you know, I would strongly um, you know advocate on behalf of this community, on behalf of any community, um, and would reject any accusations of dual identities or, or divided loyalties. 
Thank you for sharing that. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And um, I, you know, Amanda, your comments earlier just really spoke to me because I, I, I have been through those experiences myself uh, going through my career in the State Department. I remember one of my earlier assignments, I was in Western Europe in a country that shall remain nameless. And in my many meetings, I remember being asked several times about which country I represented. Uh, and in one, when I said I was from the United States, he turned to his colleague and spoke in a language which I understood, uh, and he didn't know that. And he said, only in America can they pick an Asian to represent their country, um, which at the time I was insulted. But then I think back and I look at how uh, much we've really come a long way. And I see even in countries as democratic as those in Western Europe, um, you know, the United States, for all of our faults, for all of our um, dirty laundry, we still managed to get things right. And I think diversity and inclusion, particularly in our hiring, uh, in the foreign service, in the military, uh, in government service uh, is so is so crucial uh, because we, we are uh, who we represent and we wanna build a State Department and a US government and, and our armed forces that are representative of the American people. Um, so things like that in the past that uh, would insult me, uh, now I just wear it like armor, I'm proud. Uh, quite frankly. Um, when I grew up in the United States, when California, I remember my uncle um, changed his name. My last name is Buangan in the Philippines, and he changed it because uh, no one could pronounce it, and it, it shamed him. Uh, and, um, and now I look back, and, and I wish that, uh, you know, people like him uh, would no longer feel that sense of shame. So thank you for sharing all your stories. Wait, please tell me that you responded to this person in their language. I did. I did. I responded in language and I said, um, I was born in California. <laughs> and, uh, and he shut up. And then he ended up publishing a very glowing article in their newsletter. I mean, and he was the, he was the union leader of a very large industry in this country, a very powerful one at that. And, um, so his, his, uh, he had, but he represented, uh, a mindset that, you know, I mean, whether you're in Western Europe or here in the United States, uh, it represents an old mentality. And, and, and I think this is the reason why in a lot of countries like the United States, like in Western Europe, right, where, where, are, where you have significant immigrant populations like us, uh, the, it's necessary to, to have a diverse and inclusive um, set of civil, serv civil service professionals and diplomats and military that represent us because that's that, that is who we are. I'm, I'm proud to see it now in a lot of our industries and in, in, on the police, teachers, uh, those in public service. We need, we need to do more. The, the, the work is still unfinished. Um, but I think with efforts at the White House, particularly with this administration, to, 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 to really emphasize diversity, inclusion, equ equity, and accessibility, um, we, we really have made historic strides. So, um, well, that was a great conversation. Uh, let's ask, let's go to the next question. This is from Vannery, who asks, how can we as ASEAN young professionals in the United States get the same support for amplifying our voices and gain careers in US foreign policy as our ASEAN youth counterparts in the EU, China, ASEAN region, and elsewhere? Um, maybe, Jung, you want to answer that? And I, I could probably also build on that. Um, Richard, why don't you go go ahead? I'm chewing on that. <laughs> okay. Well, um, first of all, I think you know what a lot of our uh, ASEAN young professionals in the U.S. A lot of what Asian Americans are doing now, whether they're in government or working in the foreign policy field or international relations, uh, international business and economics, um, you're you're doing your part, uh, whether you realize it or not. Uh, you are. Um, uh, you are amplifying voices. You are uh, showing the world, particularly those in ASEAN and in Asia Pacific, um, what we're all about. And I think that, um, you know, in terms of having a career in U.S. foreign policy, you don't have to work at the State Department or DOD or intelligence community to really, to really play that part. Uh, I think uh, in, in everything that we do. Uh, in whatever uh, industry that we're good at, whatever profession, um, we, we show that in the United States, uh, it, it's that adage that anywhere, uh, any, at any time, you, you can succeed. And, you know, we've just heard these incredible stories from our distinguished panel 
today of how uh, through hardship and um, and strife uh, we persevere. And America is one of the very few countries that allows that, even in times where we're having internal debates uh, among ourselves about the racism and the bigotry and the violence that still exists in this country that's fueled by racism. Um, we still manage to 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 uh, to rise above it and find opportunities to to talk about our experiences. So um, I think that you know we get this question a lot about what uh, can 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 they do to uh, gain the same support as others who are serving their country in a in a in official capacity, like like Dr. Pak and I do. You're doing just as much, and in some respects, you're doing more. So thank you for that, uh, and appreciate that question. John? Richard, Richard, that was a great answer, um, and I'm glad you went first. Um, but the first thing that popped out, popped into my mind, and Vannery, um, good to have you on, uh, was what Dr. Quay said about, you know, do it where you are. Um, you do it local. You do it um, in your neighborhoods. You do it in your towns. You do it in your cities. You do it in your library. Um, you do it uh, at a national level or at an international level, but, um, but find that space. Um, and in that space, you are making a difference. Um, and also think about what kinds of, how you are a role model, regardless of whether you consider yourself to be a role model, um, with your neighbors, with your, with your neighbor's children, um, to your children, to your aunts and uncles, um, and that you, know, that, that you don't have to be this, uh, you, know, you don't have to work at the State Department like Richard Weingen as acting assistant secretary um, to, to make an impact. Of course, you know, I love Richard dearly, uh, but but it's it's also in a in a local way and in and, and in your communities that has uh, ripple ripple effects um, that you may not even see just yet, but you might see 10, 20 years down the line. Um, we have a few minutes uh, to wrap things up uh, before I um, uh, have the last uh, say some concluding remarks. I wanted to ask if any of our distinguished guests wanted to say uh, some parting thoughts or, or comments or or things as, as we as we uh, leave here and, and continue to be inspired. I have um, one of the suggestions. Please. We are talking about diversity. I am in, from Singapore. It's well diverse, right? You have, you know, you have Tamil, we have Malay, Eurasian, you have uh, uh, Chinese, you know, and every time uh, you have to live together and uh, we work together. So uh, for us uh, working in the U.S., uh, actually a few years ago, um, probably about eight years ago, I started off an advisory board. The advisory board, I'm the own, I'm the chairman of the advisory board for the bank. And I'm the only, uh, I would say I'm a Singaporean Chinese or overseas Chinese, you call it. Then we have three African-American, we have three Latino, and we have a Korean, and we have uh, two Filipino serving on the advisory board. The reason I do, uh, we started it is because I want to have a very well diversified advisory board that they can give me feedback uh, beside the community. and. To make things worse, what I did is well, what we did, not I did, is that we make our employee any anybody with the title of vice president and above, they have to serve and including the our board of directors, thirty hours for an organization volunteering every year, okay, thirty hours, and also that we counted this as a twenty percent of their job uh, job performance. That's a lot. This is. That's what uh, I'd like to share with everybody. Oh, that's great. Thank you for saying, Shivan. Anyone else? If I may, Richard, I, I just want to add um, that, um, uh, first off, I, I'd want to say to everyone who's listening that just by the work that you do, you are representing and representation matters so much. That's how you inspire the next generation and for them to be able to see someone who's Singaporean, someone who's Cambodian, someone who's Vietnamese, someone who's Malaysian or Burmese to do the work that you do. That is so phenomenal. Um, and I, I would say keep to our listeners, keep doing what you're doing and inspiring the next generation. It matters, it really matters. It does. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd love to add that 
there's this stereotype for Asian Americans as a model minority myth, you know, that if we put our heads down and don't speak up, you know, one day we'll be handed the keys to the kingdom. And um, I, I want everyone who's listening in to, to know that you matter, you, um, your space, who you are, wherever um, you're calling in from, you matter. Uh, and that you deserve to be seen. Your stories matter, your pain matters, your heritage matters. Um, and that you know, no one is powerless when we come together and no one is invisible when we demand to be seen. So demand to be seen. Amen. Well said. Anyone else? All right. Well, as much as it pains us, uh, this great conversation has to come to an end. Uh, thank you all for your questions and for your comments. I was just looking at the chat box and, and what a great conversation uh, you all have had just, you know, uh, uh, by chatting amongst yourselves and throwing questions out for us to, to, to answer. Thank you for, um, for, for joining us and just being active listeners. Um, I do want to leave you with a couple of things uh, just to, 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 to think about and things if you're interested in learning more or tuning in, um, particularly about the ASEAN Summit. Uh, if you're interested in, in more about the ASEAN Summit, uh, we have our, um, our uh, Dr. Kurt Campbell of the NSC, uh, who's going to be giving a preview of the event on Wednesday, May 11th at 9 a.m. This is Eastern Time. And you can register to attend in person or virtually uh, at the U.S. Institute of Peace's website. We'll also post the event link in the chat. Also, the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders will meet on May 12th. And that meeting is open to the public and will be live streamed. So you can find out more through the website of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. And we'll post that link also in the chat as well. Uh, thank you uh, to Crystal, who I believe uh, had to drop early, uh, Jung, Erica, Simon, Amanda, uh, Mosey Wynn, Sreiran, uh, and Erica uh, Jung uh, for, for joining us, uh, Senator Duckworth as well, who had to leave. Uh, such inspirational voices, uh, and I know I walk away inspired uh, today, and, and thank you for sharing your stories. It was great to meet you all uh, and to see how much the Southeast Asian American community has done uh, and what I'm sure you, you've done and what you all will continue to do. Uh, and to those of us who are joining, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you found this discussion inspiring and learned a bit about the resilience, strength, diversity, and unity of the Southeast Asian American community. Goodbye for now, and we'll see you uh, on a future event. Thank you.